Lenny Wilson here with Psycho with Six Homeschool Sanity. And as promised, I have a very special guest today, and that is Dr. Carl Werner. Not only an ER physician and an amazing researcher in the field of creation and evolution, an author, a video producer, but a personal friend. I am so thrilled that Carl took the time to join you today and to answer your questions. I have had Carl speak at my church twice. And the most exciting thing for people who were there to watch Carl's presentation, not that the presentation wasn't amazing because it was <laughs> both times uh, that he presented for my church, but people were clamoring to ask Dr. Werner questions about how they can either defend creation to their evolution believing friends and family members, but also to answer their own questions Maybe things that are getting in the way of them having confidence in creation. And so I have asked Carl to do that for my audience, which is fantastic. You're going to want to share this broadcast with your friends and invite them to ask their questions as well. We are going to be giving away these video copies. Here they are. He has two videos currently produced and they are evolution the grand experiment and living fossils and we're going to be showing you the books later on but with a comment you will be entered to win these videos so please comment while we are going along and i'm going to be putting your questions up for dr werner to answer as well okay so carl go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit more. Tell us more about you and your family. And how did you, as an ER physician, get to the place where you are an expert on creation and evolution science? You know, you know I, I believe, believe in, in creation. creation. I'm a child as a um, college kid, I started to fall away from my faith, believing that uh, evolution was true. And over dinner one night, I had a fellow ask me three questions that turned me around. And th these three questions were about how things got started. He said, Carl, you believe in the Big Bang. And uh, if you think the Big Bang happened naturally, how would the matter form? Because, Carl, you know the laws of physics say that matter doesn't form on its own. How do you, how do you explain the Big Bang? How would you get matter? I had no answer to that, Dr. Wilson. And then he said, Carl, how would you explain life starting from chemicals? Because you know good and well, Carl, the laws of biochemistry say that DNA doesn't form naturally. So how could life start naturally in chemicals and go to living things if DNA doesn't form? And the third question was, Carl, what do you deal with the what do you do with the fossil record? Because there's like, well, now there's a billion fossils that have been collected but the, the fossils don't show evolution. There's gaps between each of these groups. And that those three questions sent me on a life mission to try to sort this out because um, I knew that it was evolution evidence and yet this fellow just more or less decimated naturalism. And so I just, over time, traveled the world, got married, traveled the world with my wife and did these interviews with the natural science um, museum scientists and uh, finally sorted this out. And I'm, I'm so confident now that evolution is does not work. Okay. And do you remember when you were sure that it didn't work? Do you remember, like, was there a moment or was it really kind of like a, was it an evolution, Carl? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, you're thinking. <laughs> no, there was a moment. And here was a problem I had and this is a content of our second book, Living Fossils, is when I realized that there's representatives from all the modern animals that are found with the dinosaurs. In other words, the, the animals and plants during the time of the dinosaurs were the same as now. When I realized that boa constrictors and box turtles and ducks lived alongside the dinosaurs, as told me by the evolution scientists, then I realized, well, nothing has changed. That was a watershed moment for me that I realized, you know what, this theory is over. It's fini, you know? Yeah. 
You know, and I have to tell, even though I think I cover this in my podcast interview with you, if you haven't listened to my podcast interview with Carl, you can find it at um, ultimateradioshow.com. If you click on this little icon here for the Homeschool Sanity Show, it is one of the older episodes that I did. And so that's why you have to go to ultimateradioshow.com and not to homeschoolsanity.com to find it. Um, but you want to listen to it. But I just have to briefly say that I was firmly a creationist when I met Carl. And I wasn't that excited about hearing about his research, okay? Because I was already a creationist. It's like, I don't need to tell, have someone tell me, you know, that um, creation is true and evolution, it didn't happen the way they say that it did. Um, but I had the opportunity to meet Carl anyway. And when he shared his books with me, and in particular, I think this concept of living fossils, this is Carl's book and one of his books, his second book. And you can get this book along with his other materials at masterbooks.com. If you go to masterbooks.com slash creation slash evolution, and I'm going to put that link up there for you. And if you use the code Carl, you are going to get these materials for 36% off, which is just crazy. I mean, that is just, that is honestly crazy. I mean, that is a steal. So you need to pick them up now. You're not really going to get a better price unless um, you borrow them <laughs> from someone, <laughs> right? So I wanted to find some of the the uh, more significant fossils that really just blew my mind, Carl. So, uh, so you were talking about box turtles, Carl. And so here we have an example of a modern box turtle, a modern slider turtle, and then a dinosaur arrow turtle fossil. Try to say that three times quickly, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of trouble. Uh, but I I noticed, and there are pictures and pictures and pictures and pictures in this book that there is no difference. And I had never been presented with that information before. I always believed that the animals, the species that lived alongside the dinosaurs were completely different than the species that we have today, that they were ancient species. And obviously they had to have evolved over millions, theoretically millions and millions of years, right? But I learned from you and your books that they haven't. And you know what I asked you, this was also just brand new information for me. I wanted to know, well, how do they identify that this is a different species, the one that lived alongside the dinosaurs versus the ones that we see today? You know, isn't there like a scientific uh, formula <laughs> that they use to determine that these are different, very, very different than what we have today? And what did you tell me about that? And I'm going to show you another fossil. Every, every scientist, scientist finds, finds a fossil. fossil. He can name yeah. it anything he wants. If he thinks this fossil is fish, for example, it has a slight bump on its skeleton on one of the bones, then, hey, it's a different species. And that's how they have preserved evolution. They're taking modern animals that are found with dinosaurs and they're calling them different species names, scientific names. So unless you did the work we did, get the photographs of the fossil and the living, put them side by side, you would never know that you're being duped. Look at this. Right. The, um, that uh, You're a snail. Yeah, it's Modern a snail, snail and a snail, but one was found next to a dinosaur and one, you know, is at a snail shop here, a modern living snail, you know? Right. And it goes right. for all the seven animal groups, the seven animal phyla, they're all unchanged. It's an amazing, amazing discovery. It is. And can, can you just see how incredible these photographs are? These are beautifully uh, put together books. These are hardcover books. The... I know the photographer very well, don't I, Carl? <laughs> Your lovely wife, there she is. There she is, my, my babe. She yes. is an amazing girl. She is, and she did this photography. So where did you get all of these photographs? Where did you go to get them? So we basically went around the world, um, 200,000 miles. 
we would go to a museum and photograph the fossil, and then we'd go to the natural uh, park, the zoo, the botanical garden, and photograph the animal that was the same kind, and then place those pictures next to each other. So we went to 100 museums, and Debbie took over now over 100,000 photographs, you know, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a buttload of work, you know. That is just amazing. Yes. Now, the very first book that you put together is Evolution, the Grand Experiment. What can people expect to read in this book that will really bolster their faith and answer their critics? Well, first of all, this book is best read as a family out loud. If you've got young children, you just read one chapter a night. Mom or dad can read it. Very easy to understand. And second of all, it gives the scientific proofs against evolution. Now, scientists in the past used to think that um, that uh, uh, living things came out of scum. In other words, that mice came from dirty underwear. That's what the, the top scientists used to believe. And they used to believe that scum came out of sterile water and things like that. When you read these stories in hindsight, they are hilarious. And your faith, I believe, will be greatly encouraged once you understand that the facts um, of science do not go along with evolution. They really don't. You know? um, there, were, there was a little bit of buzzing there, Carl, when you were um, speaking, so I'm not sure where that came from because it stopped now. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, and now it's starting again when you're talking, so I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> but... Um, that was that was really great, and it is it is such an excellent education, and it's so it's so um, understandable. You know, you mm -hmm. put it in these high order, you know, super complex um, concepts and language. It is easy for kids to understand. It's easy for adults to understand because aren't a lot of us adults confused about this issue as well? Yeah, and the scientists want you to be confused because it, then they can just be in control of the argument. But you can write this material very simple so any non-science mom can teach it to their kids and yeah. any child can learn it. I'm, I'm saying a sixth grader could master this material. How's my audio now? Uh, it's still buzzing quite a bit. I don't oh, know what happened okay. because everything's oh. going great. Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. Um, but yeah, so it's really written at a middle school level. And I think you can make it understandable to a much younger uh, grade level. I don't know if our comments are coming in, Carl. And if they're not, would you do us the favor of taking time to answer people's questions? Um, maybe a little bit later. Oh, there, I just saw one. Yay. Oh, yeah, that's wonderful. Okay, so um, my friend Michelle says most of us came out of public school. Her mom did not realize that sh they were learning evolution. Isn't that the truth? Mm -hmm. And you're learning evolution also at the Christian colleges and the, some of the religious schools. Um, the teachers are as confused as the parents. And uh, uh, it's really all of our responsibility to learn this topic and teach it to our children because, you know, there's no reason for anyone to believe in evolution. But we all have to, to, to get it, understand it, be able to knock it down and do that in front of our children you know, to uh, show the kids that it does not work. Right. And um, right. I mean, it, that is that is absolutely so true. You can definitely find this even in Christian schools. So um, you have to, as homeschoolers, I think, be um, be willing to educate ourselves. And these materials are just amazing for educating ourselves as well as our kids. And again, they are on sale. You're always looking for tools to teach your kids and yourself, Michelle says. So these videos, first of all, I have to tell you a cool thing that my youngest child is <laughs> back a movie star and has a, a little cameo in this video. Uh, but these videos are great. If you want to just pop in a video and talk with um, friends and family who are really in the evolution camp, but maybe they're more, you know, open 
to to hearing maybe what you've learned and what you have to share, then these videos would be great. And I'm going to be giving away copies of these video to people who comment on this particular broadcast. So um, my youngest did not make it into this video, sadly. <laughs> he was a one and done actor, right, Carl? <laughs> he, he wasn't the dinosaur, that's why he was too Yeah, young. there you go. Uh, Natalie says, do we know the number of species of, say, dinosaurs? We've checked out books from the library on prehistoric creatures that list as many as 600 uh, prehistoric creatures. You loved your explanation and how new names and species are invented by one characteristic difference. Crazy, she says. So do we know how many species of dinosaurs there yeah. are? Or were? Yeah. You know, um, they would say, the evolution scientists would say there's uh, six or 700 species of dinosaurs, but others would call that number down to say, you know, what you're calling a, a different dinosaur species is actually the same species, it's just found at a different location. So the number is greater than one, but it's less than 700, how many there actually are, somewhere yeah. in between there. But there is a tendency for each scientist who wants to name an animal, a fossil, because then they get credit. They're famous. I found the first yeah, whatever. Yeah, sure. you know. And um, yeah. But the number is less than what it, what it stated because they tend to parse out the smallest details and then call them new species. Yeah, and I would think that that's probably true of a lot of different um, animal classes, isn't it? Oh, yeah. You know, like for humans, they have named Homo sapiens when they found fossil Homo sapiens over 100 species. You know, I mean, I don't know why you would do that, but, you know, instead of calling it Homo sapiens, you call it uh, Homo caput infinitus, you know, because you think it's a, a, an ape man, but it's really just a, it's a human. So there's a great tendency for these scientists to just make up these Latin names and consider themselves smart and famous, but in reality, they're just renaming the same animal over and over and over again. It just makes a mess in the literature. You know? Right. Thank you for that question, Natalie. And I apologize about the the sound. Um, I hope it's only <laughs> buzzing on my end and it's not on yours. I mean, you can you can tell me in the comments if, if you're having trouble with it. I'm still able to hear what he's saying. Uh, fortunately, um, it's it's always technology, isn't it? <laughs> it's just always fun stuff. Uh, but yes, that they are getting credit. It is buzzing for you too. Okay. Um, it makes sense um, that they get credit for discovering it. And, you know, I didn't realize that. I thought that there was some scientific metric that they could use to say, yep, this is a completely different and new species, an ancient speci species that doesn't correlate to what we have today. So I wanted to make sure that I tell you about the teacher's manuals that go along with these books as well. And this is what I really love about those. So these are paperback books that go along with the hardcover books. And the discount on getting the kits that you can find at masterbooks.com slash creation slash evolution. I'll put that link up for you when we are done. Um, but you will have not only some tests, which are kind of nice just to make sure that kids are getting it, uh, but you get my favorite part, which is you get class discussion questions. And this is recommended to be uh, discussed with your kids before they watch the video, uh, which I think is really, really great. Before they read the chapter, rather, I should say, not the video, um, because you'll find out what kids think and then you're priming them to be listening for the answers, right, Carl? I mean, I know that from from teaching study skills that that is an excellent approach um, to teaching. Um, I am going through these books, Carl, and I'm thinking I need to reread these to my kids because when I got them from you uh, the first time, my younger kids were quite young and they need to go through all of this material again. It is it is absolutely fascinating. So, Carl, I know even though it's going to be buzzing a little bit, um, I would love to hear about the project that you are working on now, the next volume in this series that will come out at a later date. Yeah, uh, Debbie and I are uh, working on our next volume, which is called Human Evolution Untold Stories. And it's everything that, a 
about human evolution that you were not told the most important facts. Like, uh, for example, did you know that uh, over 40 scientists created eight men from non-primate mammals like dogs and cats and pig fossils and dolphin fossils? Over 40 scientists. Like, I'm talking about the curator and um, and uh, the, the, the directors of the museum. The director of the American Museum of Natural History, uh, he found this tooth, and it, he said it was an uh, eight-man tooth, but it was a pig tooth. So the information we have is we simply broke down all of the eight-man species. There's about 500 of them. And broken down by category. Okay, which ones were created by scientists altering the fossils? There's a whole there's a whole book of those. And then which eight men were created by scientists digging up modern human beings and finding them? Eight men. Well, there's two books of that. And which eight men were created from other kind of am animals like raccoon bones and, and dolphin bones? And there's a whole category of that. And which eight men were created out of extinct apes? And there's a whole category of that. When you get down to what is actually, what do we have left? It's very small set of fossils, and none of them are really complete. And they, they're basing everything now on these latest fossils, only to ignore the fact that oh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of these things have already gone under the carpet. You know, you swept them under the carpet that they were just hey, oh, we're not going to remind you about how bad we are. On identifying animals, you know, if we call an arm bone a leg bone, and we call you know a primate a dog, or vice versa, we're not going to tell you about that. But Debbie and I decided to tell you guys about that because I think it's a a very important point for credibility in the field of science, which human evolution has very little credibility. Very, yeah. yeah. I had the opportunity to hear your presentation on human evolution and it was just excellent and and I was shocked at how a scientist could find a tiny a, a, tooth, a tooth and conjecture that this was an ape man from that I, I think most people have no idea that this is the history of human evolution and to cobble supposedly ape man fossils together from all kinds of animal um, fossils um, and bones to say, oh yes, this is an ape man. And the thing that you said during that presentation that I have really held on to, because honestly, I get nervous every time I hear about the newest ape man. <laughs> you know, I think, oh no, what if they come up with something that we can't refute? And what you said was that all we have to do when they come up with more eight man fossils is give it time because over time these fossils have been debunked um we've determined either that they're an animal fossil that it's purely human that it's purely ape and up and up until this time even though we have some that have not been um sorted out yet so many of these ape man fossils have been determined not to be ape men. And so right. we, can have, we can have, um, you know, just peace of mind in knowing that it's, they're just not getting where they want to go, are they? Time is the enemy of evolution scientists because the longer the fossils are around, the more people look at it, the more people study it compared to other animals. And then over maybe 50 to 100 years, typically, it gets overturned. It does, it's not overturned the first 10 or 20 years, typically. And um, the other worst case scenario for an evolution scientist is they find this little piece of bone, they say it's an ape man, but then when someone finds the rest of it, like finds a complete specimen, that that's very dangerous for them because they realize, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, that was just an ape, you know, you know like Ramapithecus. Or, oh my gosh, that was, you know, the pig's mouth or something. You know, um, the, what they're basing these ape men on typically are small fragments of fossils that they can conjecture what the rest of the animal looked like. Not the bone they have in their hand, but, but everything else. And uh, uh, it's a funny field. Yeah, so Michelle wants to know, is DNA testing an option? And she isn't sure how that works. Yeah, DNA testing, you would think that is very objective and simple to do, but there's 
several problems. Number one, a lot of the fossils don't have DNA in them. And um, so DNA is very fragile, and uh, usually it breaks down quite quickly after an animal dies. The second problem is, is that, like, a human has three billion letters of DNA, and so if you're going to find a fossil and it does have DNA and you're going to compare it, there's a lot of wiggle room on how you interpret that, because you have to compare apples with apples, but you can compare apples with oranges. And um, recently they deciphered the human and the ape genome, and they said that they were only a half percent different. But in the footnotes, it actually said it's five percent difference between oh, wow. apes and yeah. And so, you know, it's like whatever the intent of the science is, he can say something or find that result if he wants to find it. So when you're dealing with three billion letters, it's hard for that to be sorted out quickly. It's going to take 10, 20 years for that to get sorted out. Yeah. Um, and you know what was so disconcerting from your presentation on human evolution, too, was the number of people with intent to deceive. Um, it, it's definitely not the case that everyone was trying to deceive. You know, sometimes they were just mistaken, right? But there were so many people with respect to human evolution who were trying to pull one over on us, right? Yes, and uh, there's a lot of them, um, more than you want to know. Like the curator from the Natural History Museum in London, uh, Dr. Hinton, he, he actually was the one that took the orangutan jaw and cut it down, shaved it, and planted it for other scientists to find as an ape man. Now, he's, he's a scientist. He's a curator at the museum. He did that. And Dr. Dart, who found, you know, Australopithecus for the first time, he measured this brain. He had the full brain of half the brain, so it would be very easy. And he tripled the size of the Australopithecine brains in his measurements. And there's others who, who knew better what they were doing. They called something a fossil, but the really just a recently buried bone. They write, oh, I found this fossil, you know. In other words, it should be rock, but it's actually just, you know, like soft bone that you just find you know, grandma's remains, you know. And so, yes, there is a lot of that, much more than I ever thought I would find. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, very disappointing. Um, mm -hmm. Those of you who are still listening, let me know if my audio is buzzing also or if it's just on Carl's part. Um, I wonder if, um, if it's just the platform today. Sometimes that happens. Um, it, it's it's unfortunate, but um, I love technology. I love technology. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love it. Um, but thank you for hanging in there with us. You are going to want to get your copy of these materials. They are fantastic. Okay, it is just Carl's side. All right, not not that that makes it any better. <laughs> um, but okay. So we would love to hear your questions. I mean, Carl is honestly just a wealth of information. And you are, if you are watching the replay and you have a question about something to do with uh, creation versus evolution, um, why the theory doesn't hold up, Carl is the person to ask. And I will make sure that he sees your questions and can answer uh, those for you if it's at a later date. Okay, so, but you're going to want to grab these materials while they are on sale. You're going to want to comment so that you are entered to win those videos. So here they are again. You're gonna see those in a list of materials. These are by Dr. Carl Werner. Um, they are fabulous. These are the kinds of books that, you're, that you are going to want to keep around. I keep lending mine and then losing them because people keep them. <laughs> so if you want to get your own copy because I'm not going to lend you mine. These are mine. <laughs> okay. And so, Carl, tell us where we can find you because I know people are going to want to connect with you online. Okay. So, uh, thegrandexperiment.com is our webpage, and there is a connect button there. Uh, if you wanted to uh, send me a note on um, thegrandexperiment.com, that'd be the simplest way to reach me. Okay, that's perfect. Um, oh, okay. So Natalie has a quick question for us, and we have just a minute left, but she asks, 
do you have any thoughts on the dinosaurs evolved into birds theory? I know you do. Yeah, um, that theory has been put forth, but um, recently National Geographic had one of these flying dinosaurs. It was a, a dinosaur, half dinosaur, half bird, and it was proved to be a fake. And it turns out that nearly all of these half dinosaur, half bird are found in the area called Wyoming, China. And it turns out BBC went over there and they found that there is a um, industry of shops that will make up animals for you. So they say, what animal you want? You want what kind of dinosaur tail and what kind of bird you want me to put together? Now that was in the BBC show, The Dinosaur That Filled the World. And uh, nearly all of these uh, fossil evidence has come from that one area where the industry is where they're creating these fossils. And um, it just doesn't work. And if you read my book and the appendix on that, the Green Book Evolution Grand Experiment, that has that information. Yeah, so this this is the book. This is the book that Carl's talking about. This is the one, Evolution, the Grand Experiment, that will talk about that. And this is so fabulous, um, guys, because he has now, of course, I'm not going to be able to find it. Here we go. So he has... Uh, these little boxes that have the experts. Now, these are the evolution experts. These are these are not creation scientists. These are evolutionary scientists who will admit on video and in their quotes that are in this book that um, evolution doesn't work. <laughs> They're admitting <laughs> to the holes in the theory, aren't they? Isn't that just incredible? Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's amazing. It is amazing. And so um, this is definitely something that you are going to want to show your kids, show your family. Like I said, now, if you have someone who is just staunch, uh, they are into it, you know, um, because Carl and I have talked with people like this. Um, what I have found in my experience with dealing with people who are really into evolutionary research and uh, and how to refute uh, people like us is that when I have gotten them to a place where they can't defend their position on a certain point anymore, they just switch to a different <laughs> to a different topic. Um, and so it, it kind of becomes it's just kind of, you know, spinning your wheels. And so I think it makes a lot more sense to talk to people who, you know, there are there are thousands, if not millions of Christians who believe in evolution because of how they've been educated. And they would be very open to hearing Carl's research on this issue. And so you could share the book with them or give them their own copy or, or show the video to them. And I think you will be so um, happy that you did because it's, it is such a faith affirming topic. And for many people, it isn't. It's the thing that kind of keeps them from truly trusting God and truly believing in his word. And so, Carl, you have done an amazing service to the kingdom of God by providing this science. It is not pseudoscience. This is directly from the top museums, the top archaeological uh, sites or paleontology paleontological sites is that a word <laughs> around the world so um you know this is not like carl's theory that he cooked up in his in his own um, office this is from someone who believed evolution was a valid theory and tried to prove it and couldn't all right find him at the grand experiment.com thank you so much for joining me carl i'm so sorry about the technical issues thank you to those of you who are watching and uh like i said you can listen to the podcast episode that i did with carl and i'm going to link you up in the comments on this video to that as well as long as well as how you can get these materials with a fantastic discount from masterbooks.com carl thanks a ton Oh, it's great to be with you and your, your crew there. Thank you. No problem. Okay, see you next time. Natalie says thank you. Bye, Natalie.